Koda and his rebel company were invited to come and bring incense to the tabernacle in order to become priests, of course. Their colleagues, Dathan and Abiram, had not taken so bold a stand as Korah did. Moses summoned them to appear before him, hoping that they might have been drawn into the conspiracy without having become wholly corrupted. Moses was always trying to think better of people than they were. So, how did these two rebels react when Moses asked them to come and speak to him? But they would not come. And they stubbornly refused to acknowledge his authority. Listen to their bitter, hateful speech, their reply. If my heart is evil, my actions are evil. The devil rejoices and God weeps. Now listen, this is what they said to Moses. Isn't it enough that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey? Of course, nonsense. They were slaves. And now you want to lord it over us? Poor Moses! Have you been falsely accused lately? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Have you ever come across such unreasonable people? You know, in communication, you either do a dialogue, means two people talk, or a debate. You've got your point and you want to state your point and don't confuse me with the facts. This is what's happening here. No dialogue. Selfishness makes us arrogant. I'm right and you're wrong. And selfishness makes us more humble than Jesus. And I want to be like Jesus, not arrogant like the devil. By the way, people don't... Uh, like arrogant people. He had been as a tender father. A patient shepherd was represented in the blackest character of a tyrant and a usurper. Their exclusion from Canaan in punishment of their own sins was charged upon Moses. It's your fault. The, bl the, the, the blame game, Adam and Eve. Had this happened to you, has this happened to you? People blaming you and you, you're innocent. That's difficult. But this is life and you've got to go through it without retaliation. It was evident that the sympathies of the people were with the rebellious party. Poor Moses. But he, you know, he made no effort at self Vindication. He didn't explain anything to them. Sometimes you don't have to explain your innocence. Follow Moses' example. We don't do, do, have to defend ourselves. Let God do it. He solemnly appealed to God. This is the best way to handle accusations. In the presence of the congregation, as a witness to the purity of his motives and the uprightness of his conduct, and implored him to be his judge. When people criticize you, it's their opinion only. You don't have to accept their criticism as truth. Then Moses became, says, very angry and said to the Lord, do not accept their offering. I've not taken so much as a donkey from them, nor have I wronged any of them. Now, what does that very sad means? The Septuagint says exceedingly sad. Moses was exceedingly sad. Don't hate. Become exceedingly sad when people blame you. Exceedingly sad. 
are like this. Moses said to Kora, you and all your followers are to appear before the Lord tomorrow, you and they and Aaron. So Aaron will also be there and the official priests and of course the new opposition. Who were their followers? Each man is to take his censer and put incense in it. 250 censers in all and present it before the Lord. You and Aaron are to present your censers also. What an important moment in the history of Moses and the people of God. They had to appear in the court of the tabernacle. They had to appear before God, the judge of all people. Did they realize this? You know, one day on the History Channel, I want to, to look at this event. It is so momentous. So each man took his censer, put fire and incense in it, and stood with Moses and Aaron at the entrance to the tent of meeting. What a solemn moment. Who's going to win the battle? Where did they get the fire? Because they, they had to have fire. From the altar of burnt offering, right there in the court, 250 put fire in their bands. When Korah had gathered all his followers in, in opposition to them, at the entrance of the tent of meeting, Listen to this. The glory of the Lord appeared to the entire assembly. Two million people saw the glory of God. What a tense moment. Oh, uh, what do you think is the glory of God? The glory of God appeared to the entire assembly. How many were they? About two million. So, it must have been huge for every person in that congregation to see it. It was not Moses who assembled the congregation to behold the defeat of Korah. No. And of course his, his company as well. But the rebels in their blind presumption had called them together to witness their victory. <laughs> you know, sometimes we think we're going to gain the victory. And then we meet with defeat. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, separate yourselves from the assembly so I can put an end to them at once. The man that was fired <laughs> was chosen by God to stay in his position. There are times when we will have to separate ourselves from the rebellious to avoid their fate. And maybe you are associating with a rebellious person. Break the contact. Save your life. And maybe his life as well. But Moses and Aaron fell face down and cried out, Oh God, God of the spirits of all mankind, will you be angry with the entire assembly? when only one man sins. Moses was so kind. <laughs> Please, Lord, no, don't do it. So what will happen next? Korah had withdrawn from the assembly to join Dothan and Abiram. When Moses, accompanied by the 70 elders, went down with a last warning to the men who had refused to come to him. But just before Moses could give his message, the Lord spoke to him. Listen, Moses, just a minute, just a minute. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to the assembly, Move away from the tents of Korah, Dathan and Abiram. Move away, move away. There are people, certain people, that we have to move away from. Why? What is going to happen to the rebels? Moses got up and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. What a, 
a very sad, very, very sad and heartbreaking, disastrous moment in the history of Israel. People are going to die and God is crying. He wants the assembly move back from the tents of these wicked men. The same message comes to you and me. Do not touch anything belonging to them or you will be swept away because of all their sins. Please don't associate with rebellious people. The chief rebels saw themselves abandoned by those whom they had deceived, but the rebellion was unshaken. Here, everybody leaves them. Was God calling them, the rebels, to repentance? Yes! This is the God we serve. Listen, Korah, said the Holy Spirit, your supporters are leaving you. Please, Korah, give your heart to me. Somewhere here at Kadesh Barnea, they stood with their families in the door of their tents, as if in defiance of the divine warning. So they moved away from the tents of Korah, Dathan and Abiram. Dathan and Abiram had come out and were standing with their wives, children and little ones at the entrance to their tents. Can you see the arrogance? How many of their close family joined them? We're not sure. God did not impose this death penalty upon small children. But as often happens, innocent children suffered for the obstinacy of their parents who refused to repent or even to heed the warning to flee. Did some of Korah's family survive the penalty? Some of the children saw the enormity of the sins of their parents and they fled. What a lesson for children with evil parents. Children, if you're looking at this lecture, obey your parents, but distance yourself from their wickedness. Don't follow them in wickedness. Distance yourself. Then Moses said, this is how you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things, that it was not my idea. Listen, this is not my idea, Moses said to them. If these men die a natural death, and experience only what usually happens to men, then the Lord has not sent me. Now this is, this is something. This is something. But if the Lord brings about something totally new, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them with everything that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the grave, then you will know that, the, that these men have treated the Lord with contempt. Can you visualize this? All eyes are on Moses while they fearfully wait to see what will happen. Will they die a natural death? Or will the earth open? As soon as he finished saying all this, the ground under them split apart and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them with their households and all Korah's men, and all their possessions. Can you visualize this disaster? This was an instantaneous act of God to prevent the spread of a rebellious spirit that had already perverted and infected the entire congregation. The onlookers fled in haste, self-condemned as if partakers of the same sin. They went down alive to the grave and God cried with everything they owned. The earth closed over them and they perished and were gone from the community. What an unbelievable divine intervention. You don't have to fight your fights. Leave it to the Lord. He will repay 
evil for evil. You cannot do it. This trauma could have been prevented. Number 1634. At their cries, all the Israelites around them fled, shouting, the earth is going to swallow us too. Other people were at a distance, having removed themselves. The sound of the convulsion of the earth engulfing the rebels and of the victims' shrieks of fear and dismay caused them to flee still further away. Can you hear it? Can you see this, this moment? Tell me, was there still time for repentance? I'm speaking of the followers of Korah. Yes. We serve a long-suffering God. When Moses was entreating Israel to flee from the coming destruction, the divine judgment might even then have been stayed if Korah and his company had repented and sought forgiveness. What a gracious, long-suffering God. He will make it difficult for you and me to get lost. He will plead till the last moment. But their stubborn persistence sealed their doom. The entire congregation were sharers in their guilt, for all had, to a greater or lesser degree, sympathized with them. They also lost their credibility in my eyes and your eyes. How sad. God in his great mercy made the distinction between the leaders and the rebellion and their followers. God is a fair God. He only punishes what matches the crime. The people who had permitted themselves to, de to be deceived were still granted space for repentance. In law, Language they speak of lex talionis, a tooth for a tooth, not ten teeth, ten tooth for one teeth. The penalty balances the judgment. Overwhelming evidence had been given that they were wrong and that Moses was right. The signal manifestation of God's power had removed all uncertainty. Jesus, the angel who went before the Hebrews, sought to save them from their destruction. Forgiveness was lingering for them, and maybe for you too, my friend, and for myself. The judgment of God had come very near and appealed to them to repent. I love the God of the Old Testament. He's a pleading God, a crying God, a saving God. A special irresistible interference from heaven had arrested their rebellion. If they would respond to the interposition of God's providence, they might be saved. But while they fled from the judgments through fear of destruction, their rebellion was not cured. Did they reflect on disastrous results of the rebellion? I don't think they did, or otherwise they ignored it. They returned to their tents terrified, but unfortunately not repentant. They had been flattered by Korah and his company until they really believed themselves to be very good people. Oh, it's so dangerous to think you are smart spiritually. What a dangerous theology. Only God is good. We must always appreciate our sinful, fallen human nature. You know, the older I become, the more I realize what a sinner I am. I need him daily, hourly. They stubbornly believed that they had been wronged and were abused by Moses. This is where rebellion takes you to. At Serebim El Kadim, I asked Loretta what would have happened if they admitted that they were wrong. Listen to her explanation. Should they admit, my dad, that Korah and his company were wrong? 
and Moses write, then they would be compelled to receive as the word of God the sentence that they must die in the wilderness. They didn't want to die. Loretta, what else do you want to share with us? Please carry on, my child. They were not willing to submit to this, and they tried to believe that Moses had deceived him. Please don't think that somebody is so wicked. Try and think well of people. They had fondly cherished the hope that the new order of things was about to be established, in which praise would be substituted for reproof and ease for anxiety and conflict. Loretta, how were they misled? She said the men who had perished had spoken flattering words and had professed great interests in love for them. You know, Eli, the high priest, never reprimanded his children. He said they're okay, they're fine. If you've got children, tell them their mistakes. Don't praise them. Tell them how to repent. I learned so, so much from this experience. They concluded that Korah and his companions must have been good men and Moses the culprit. Loretta, to what extent did the rebels really go? It is hardly possible for men to offer greater insult to God than to despise and reject, now listen to this, the instrumentalities he would use for their salvation. But Dad, that's not all. The Israelites had not only done this, but had purposed to put both Moses and Aaron to death. Dad, she said to me, they did not realize the necessity of seeking pardon of God for their grievous sins. Loretta continues, that night of probation, I love this word probation, was not passed in repentance and confession, but in devising some way to resist the evidences which showed them to be the greatest of sinners. They still cherished hatred of God's appointment. That's the appointment of Moses and Aaron. And braced themselves to resist their authority. Satan was at hand to pervert their judgment and lead them blindfolded to destruction. Last question, my child. What happened to the 250 men who came to the tabernacle with their fire pans? We read about their tragic death in the following verse. Oh, this is so sad. And fire came down from the Lord and consumed the 250 men, celebrities, leaders, who were offering the incense. They thought they took the place of previous priests. Then fire consumed them. How sad. What are the lessons that you, that you and I have learned? Hmm. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, to pick up the senses out of the blaze, the fire, for they are holy, separated, and scattered and scatter the fire, the coals, some distance away. Number 16. The senses had been used for offering incense to Jehovah and had held sacred fire from off the altar. The senses of these men who sinned against their own souls, let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar. Because they presented them before the Lord, therefore they are holy, and they shall be a sign to the children of Israel. This is so important. The fire pans were made of bronze, in the time of Solomon, it was made of gold. So Eliezer, the priest, collected the bronze censers brought by those who had been burnt up. And he had them hammered out to overlay the altar as the Lord directed him through Moses. 
This was to remind the Israelites that no one except a descendant of Aaron should come to burn incense before the Lord, or he would become like Korah and his followers. So every time a priest was appointed in the tabernacle, he was reminded of what happens to rebellious people. Did the fire that consumed the 250 rebels call the people to repentance? This is what God wanted them to do, to repent. The next day, the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. You have killed the Lord's people, they said. Oh, no. Poor Moses. It would be difficult to find a more outstanding example of rebellion after such a demonstration of divine approval. But when the assembly gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron and turned toward the tent of meeting, suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Second time. Then Moses and Aaron went to the front of the tabernacle of meeting. How long would God allow this unrelenting rebellion to continue? And the Lord said to Moses, Get away from this assembly. As Moses told the congregation to get away from the tents of Korah. Get away from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. And they fell face down. He didn't want God to destroy his people. What was their earnest plea at this stage? That's Moses and Aaron. Lord, if you feel like wiping them out, we will support you. You may see in your wisdom that there is nothing that uh, would change the attitude. Let thy will be done. No, no, no. This is not what Moses and Aaron said. This is not the kind of prayer that Moses prayed. How did he pray? It says in verse 46, And Moses said to Aaron, Take your censer and put incense in it, along with fire from the altar, and hurry to the assembly to make atonement for them. Incense was a symbol of intercession. Listen to what the psalmist tells us. O Lord, I call to you, Come quickly to me. Hear my voice when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. Intercession. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. What is, what is Aaron going to do to stop the devastating work of the plague among the congregation? Wrath has come out from the Lord. Wrath is also called tears. And the tears has come out from the Lord. The plague has started. The Lord does not delight in punishing people. I never delighted when I punished my daughter. But it's good for her, good for me. So Aaron did as Moses said and ran into the midst of the assembly. The plague had already started among the people, so he put in the incense and made atonement for people. And he stood between the dead and the living, so the plague was stopped. Can you see Aaron with a fire pan and incense, running amongst the rebels with tears in his eyes? Is this how we should treat the rebels that we know of. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700, besides those who died in the Korah incident. My dear friend, this is the ugly profile of rebellion. It's death, eternal death. And God says, why will you die? Repent and live. Aaron became a type of Christ, our high priest who, with the incense of his righteousness, runs into our dying hour to reconcile us with God. Paul says, 
Be imitators of God. Imitate Him. Therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love, that of hatred or rebellion, just as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now you and I, who are prone to rebel, smell the incense of God's saving righteousness and repent. He wants to change our rebellion for the peace of heaven. What a transaction. But 14,700 people died from the plague in addition to those who had died because of Korah. Can, can you see the people weeping? Why? Weeping because of the death of their loved ones. Whole families were no doubt wiped out. A terrible example of the evils of rebellion against God expressed will. God has to punish. He doesn't like it, but he has to punish because he's a righteous God. But he's more a loving God than a righteous God. We qualify as rebels when we willfully transgress God's holy Ten Commandments. How does God look at our problem? How can He help me, the rebel, and you, the rebels? Son of man, say to the house of Israel, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down and we are wasting away because of them. How can we live? Maybe you're walking with a, a heavy weight of negative thoughts, anger, jealousy, envy, rebellion. Has God got a plan for us? Listen what he says. Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. If he doesn't take pleasure in the death of a wicked, what then? He cries when a rebel dies, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? My dear friend, let us, like Aaron, Fill our senses with the sweet aroma of Christ's righteousness and tell the rebels there is forgiveness and eternal life in Christ. Father in heaven, I'm astonished at your care for rebels like us. Help us to respond to your love and avoid destruction. In Jesus' name, Amen.